Hello, my name is Julie Polsinelli and I am the Assistant Director and Gallery Manager here at Valley Arts Centre. Welcome to this walkthrough of the Charles Deal Retrospective Exhibition. Today I'll be taking you through the works of art here in the gallery, as well as the stories of the man behind the art. So let's begin. The exhibition begins near the front door with the works of graphic design and illustration from the 1950s to the 1970s. These positions taught precision and artistic skill while maintaining a steady profession. However, Charles, known as Bud, began his love for art long before this. Uh, it's hard to explain this as a decision, but uh, it, it started when I was four years old, actually. Uh, my, <clears throat> my mother took us to a Disney movie, Bambi, and uh, I was so overwhelmed by it that it made me want to try to draw like Disney did. So my mother bought me a little golden book, uh, and I literally spent hours and hours and hours copying the drawings as best I could. And that was kind of the beginning for me. Bud has also found inspiration in his surroundings. When I moved to Chagrin Falls uh, in, I think it was 2000, uh, first we bought a house which needed a great deal of renovation, so that took up a couple of years. But once I got involved with the Valley Art Center, beginning uh, really in 2001, uh, I realized that I was living in a community that where watercolorists were plentiful, uh, where there are some very, very good watercolorists, and I was impressed with that and felt like I needed to try to learn how to do watercolors, uh, not necessarily to master it, but at least so that I was uh, comfortable with it. So uh, I began making watercolors. I found out that they were they are very quick uh, compared to oil painting, uh, and ultimately fairly easy for me, primarily because I had fairly strong drawing skills and I didn't have to struggle with the drawing part of the watercolors. The thing that went haywire for me as a watercolorist was that I had wanted to learn how to do this wonderful, ethereal, transparent watercolors that I was seeing accomplished watercolor artists do, uh, but I found that I was torn by my need to create a, an expanded value uh, system in, in my paintings. I yearned to put darks in my watercolors, so I kept layering the watercolors with layer after layer after paint in order to build up the depths uh, of the values. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the watercolors uh, began looking like oil paintings. Uh, that's the point where I decided I'm really destined to be an oil painter. The watercolors lead the viewer to the sculptures within the Bowen Gallery. Uh, the sculptures were really a reaction to some struggles I was having in my painting uh, on my first graduate degree, I realized that I was not very comfortable with three dimensions uh, in my paintings, and I thought if I uh, got a degree in sculpture, I would have to contend with uh, three-dimensionality. So that's what prompted it. As soon as I got started, uh, I realized that I wanted to use recognizable subject matter, unlike what I had been doing in my paintings. Uh, and uh, the war on Vietnam was underway. Uh, we were well into it by that time. And uh, like a lot of artists, I, I felt almost uh, a, a calling to say something in my artwork uh, in protest of the war, which I thought was uh, ter not only unfortunate, but uh, an illegal war. So uh, some of my pieces are basically intended to be war protest paintings. Uh, one group in particular, uh, which I intended to uh, enlarge, uh, has figures that were, that are named 
uh, from the courtroom settings, a prosecutor, a defendant, a jury, a judge, uh, and those were intended then with a, a three times enlargement uh, to be set in something, uh, some kind of a sculptural jungle setting. Uh, never really finished the idea. I, I did the small pieces, but uh, I had no access to a sculpture studio once I had completed my degree, so sculpture went by the wayside. However, I, I didn't see that as a loss because what I accomplished was what I set out for, which is uh, I was much more comfortable with three-dimensionality in my paintings at that point. Bud's oil paintings within the Bowen Gallery begin in 2005 with a mix of surrealist and familial works. Paintings like Julia in Delft transport contemporary models to the 17th century Netherlands or Apple designers and founders to the home of Mary and Martha. Julia is seen again now as triplets, contrasting the feminine pink couch with the bustling background of Route 66. Money Fruit Blues also shows two different subject matters in combination, contrasting a dark background. While Denny in 12 Parts, whose preliminary drawing we will be exploring later, shows the sharp skills of perspective and shadow, and a master of the human form. In the adjoining wall, the viewer is treated to multiple variations of the same subject. The first is the artist's wife, who poses on the couple's back porch. The light that travels through the terrace overhead creates a cascading pattern of colors and shadows. The next artworks speaks to the artist's channeling of an ulterior, dissident side. The bikers are set among surrealist backgrounds of baby dolls and eyeballs. The artist can be seen in the background of this work in a black helmet and sunglasses. Separating his earlier and more recent works are a collection of the artist's drawings. Drawing is, uh, for me, uh, the earliest art form. Uh, I started drawing when I was very small. Uh, I didn't see anything unusual about that because all little kids draw. Uh, and uh, the difference for me was that uh, I had no interest in athletics and I had no athletic ability. I couldn't run fast or jump high or do any of the uh, other things that little boys do at that age. Uh, so I put, put all my effort into drawing. And what happens, of course, is that uh, just through repetition, uh, my drawing skills developed uh, more than the other kids that I was in class with. And so I started getting complimented uh, on my drawing. Uh, my mother, of course, was, like all mothers, incredibly supportive. And she was telling me every time I did drawing, it was wonderful. So that carried me for a long time. Uh, and I became very seriously interested in drawing, partly because I didn't really even understand that there were other art forms. Uh, so I continued to draw, uh, and uh, as I got into high school, that still remained my primary art form, but I uh, took a lot of art classes in high school and uh, began realizing that there were other forms of art, although it was still a vague notion in my mind. By the time I got uh, 
reached college age, I had uh, made a, a pretty clear decision that I wanted to be a painting and drawing instructor at a college level. And uh, so my drawing became a more serious activity for me. The, uh, the drawings that I became most interested in were figure drawings. And that, that was a decision that uh, had to do with my belief that uh, figure drawing is the most challenging and difficult kind of drawing. And I thought, okay, if I can learn to deal effectively with figure, then I should be all set with whatever subject I, I choose. Uh, it became much more than that for me, though. Uh, I, uh, I began using models uh, on a consistent basis. In other words, instead of changing model every time I needed uh, a figure for a figure drawing, I would find a model that I could depend on uh, being available each time I wanted to do a drawing. So I was developing uh, without meaning to, developing uh, a kind of personal attachment uh, to the models that I use. We, we would become quasi-friends, uh, would know a little bit about the model's uh, private life, uh, likes and dislikes, uh, even the, their temperament. Uh, and that was at the same time that I began teaching uh, a drawing class to a, a group of college students. I was a graduate assistant uh, at Michigan T State at the time, and I was assigned a drawing class as my responsibility as a graduate assistant. Uh, so uh, I, I began working uh, with a, a, in our, a model uh, by the name of Denny. Uh, Denny was an excellent model. Uh, she was very dependable. She had all the, all the skills necessary for doing, I think, a very difficult job, meaning maintaining poses for long periods of time. Uh, I was uh, demanding in a sense that I would ask Denny to take poses that were difficult and couldn't be sustained for long periods. So she had to, uh, after taking a break, she would have to recreate the poses. Uh, and that's a challenge. Uh, I was also uh, in the process of developing uh, a more expanded reason for doing drawings instead of them simply being technical exercises to develop drawing skills. The more recent oil paintings begin with a double portrait of the artist and wife, enveloped in a geometric grid of details from Vermeer paintings bringing together the artist's family and his art historical inspirations. The next grouping shows stunning Italian views and seemingly nonsensical imagery, creating a story for the viewer to suss out. The work Songs for Dead Children uses the storytelling ability of juxtaposition for a more somber tone. While the work The Death of the Artist weaves together several images from Vermeer with Chicago's Cook County Hospital in 1960. The painting titled Seance is part catalog, part family photo album for the artist. Starting with the artist and his wife in the corner, this imaginary scene weaves together many of the artist's family members 
some having passed, in a surrealist version of the couple's previous home. Some family members appear more than once in different stages of their lives, in the house decorated by the same paintings which now hang on the Valley Art Center's walls in this exhibition. The next painting serves as a highlight of the artist's work, celebrating the traditional icon of the fine artist. Okay, in the Northern Renaissance uh, self-portrait, uh, i it's a slightly surreal, surrealist idea, of course, uh, uh, but I had been looking at uh, so many of the works of uh, Northern Renaissance artists uh, and I was making, it, it was as though I were seeing uh, that work for the first time. I had been uh, stubbornly resistant uh, as, a, as a student through two graduate degrees uh, toward looking at art history. I, I took what was required, but I didn't appreciate what I was looking at. I didn't really learn much from the experience. Years later, I discovered, I, I understood for the first time the value of the work of a lot of those artists. Uh, so I got intrigued by uh, the 15th century uh, and uh, what was going on, particularly in, uh, in uh, Western Europe. Very consciously put together the interior composition in the Northern Renaissance self-portrait, that is the, the portraiture part. And I, having analyzed uh, a lot of the work of the, uh, the Northern Renaissance artists, uh, I contrived a setting for myself. I compressed the space uh, so that it's deliberately cramped. I poked a hole in the back wall so that you could see uh, a view of uh, a, a village uh, behind. It happens to be uh, Chagrin Falls, where I live. Uh, I uh, put some objects in the foreground uh, to indicate that I'm an artist. Uh, a bottle of the painting medium, a pair of, a pair of uh, canvas flowers, some paint tubes. Uh, in other words, I was just contriving deliberately in a kind of flat-footed way uh, that I was uh, an artist. Uh, <clears throat> when I got to the frame, what I had originally intended to do was uh, simply paint uh, a frame. Uh, in other words, on a piece of canvas, just paint something that looked like a, a, a frame coming out of the 15th century. As soon as I started uh, in that direction, I realized that uh, that was not going to be particularly interesting. So then I thought, well, I've got a degree in sculpture, I can handle the medium, so maybe I will actually carve a frame that looks like 15th century. Uh, I gave up that idea very quickly because I didn't want to take that much time making a frame. So then I decided I moved back to my original idea, which was to paint a frame, but I deliberately stretched a very large piece of canvas uh, and painted the frame in a somewhat different style uh, from the portrait, uh, the, the interior. It's a much looser painting style, and uh, I found the, uh, a, a great model for that frame. Uh, I did some research and I found uh, an image of Botticelli's Venus uh, uh, on the half shell and uh, I found a picture that was taken in the Uffizi Gallery uh, where the frame was intact. So it's the only time I had ever seen that on the, on the Botticelli. 
if I use that as a model, I change the proportions of that uh, frame uh, and painted it and attached it to the uh, portrait, and there we have it. It's a uh, it was a mechanically complex uh, problem for me because I did a small painting and then had to surround it with a big painting with a big hole in the middle of it. Uh, so it's structurally uh, kind of complicated on the back side, which means it's rather heavy uh, as paints go. The next work, Allegory of My Stolen Memory, is, in the words of the artist, pure symbolism. While each object or figure holds meaning to the painter, it's up to the viewer to create a narrative between them all. The painting Crossroad combines previous uses of baby dolls and cityscapes. Entirely surrealist, the viewer needs to look down to see the sky, subverting norms and direct narration. Double hung together, we have wife and husband. We see the city view in the top while the artist is shown indoors. Another long painting in this section is the AHA exhibition. Set above the streets of Paris are influential artists. From left to right, René Magritte, Eugène Agé, Jan Vermeer, Max Ernst, Albrecht Dürer, Marcel Duchamp, James Cagle, Carol Wald, Edward Hopper, Hans Holbein the Younger, Francis Pacavia, Richard Estes, Kurt Schwitters, Dorothea Tanning, and Ron Crowdle. Continuing the European setting of the AHA exhibition are paintings which follow the artist's own travels. Work that's uh, coming from Europe uh, was a result of me simply being a typical tourist. Uh, my wife and I had always yearned to see Paris. Uh, I had, in fact, been in France earlier. Uh, I was uh, stationed in France uh, when I was on an activated air guard unit uh, during the Berlin Wall crisis. Uh, so I knew a little bit about France, but not particularly about Paris. I had only been there for a day or two uh, during that period. So when we finally decided that we had the resources uh, and the mutual desire uh, to go to Paris, uh, uh, we took the trip. Uh, we did all the things that tourists do on trips like that. I took lots of photographs. Uh, and we came back and I simply downloaded the photographs into my computer and then uh, occasionally looked at them, but kind of thought, uh, forgot about those. Uh, then as I began looking for ideas uh, for paintings, uh, I started making uh, referrals to the, uh, to the things that I had cataloged in the computer. And I began discovering that the the photos that interested me the most were the things that uh, happened in a foreign environment. Uh, and of course, Paris is a, uh, a beautiful city uh, and there was a kind of aesthetic richness uh, to a lot of the photographs uh, that I had brought back from Paris. And that start me, started me in that direction. And that happened at the same time that I was reading about the Surrealists. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I discovered uh, when I was reading about Surrealist was that there was a, uh, a photographer in the late 19th century by the name of Eugene Otje. And Otje was considered himself to be a journalist uh, photographer, uh, but he was commissioned by the city of Paris to document uh, the old section of Paris in 1900. Uh, the Surrealists discovered his work 20 or 25 years later 
and declared that he was a surrealist photographer. Ache continued to insist that he wasn't, but the surrealists wouldn't have that. Uh, so I, I made a great discovery when I found Ache's uh, photography and it became part of backgrounds on a number of paintings that I was doing at the time. The final section of the exhibition represents the stages of the artist's style. Abstract works are hung together, although each individual painting was created throughout decades, representing a through line of times of abstraction when the artist needed a break from his realist work. Expounding on abstraction and representing the past is Abstract 3083, created in 1963. The art world was dominated by abstract expressionism, and its influence is seen in the thick layers of house paint which cover both masonite and frame. 3D elements denote bottoms of the paint cans, as well as a piece of pottery that once hung in the right side. The final work of art in today's walkthrough is Fragments and Intersections from 2022. The painting encapsulates Charles Deal's artworks in a bittersweet and celebratory way, combining surrealism and realism, the past and the present, and family and art making. Thank you for watching.